Friends met in New York City. One was an infantry captain. His name was Ulysses S. Grant. The other man, Simon Bolivar Buckner of Kentucky, had been Grant's good friend at West Point. Grant was poor and forlorn. He asked me to cover his expenses until money could be sent. Yes, Simon Buckner would help his friend Ulysses Grant. Eight years later, the two men would meet again at the Dover Hotel by Fort Donaldson, Tennessee. Their friendship would be broken, like so much else, by the war between North and South. On April 12, 1861, cannons fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. by Americans. These explosions released decades of tension over many issues. The economic well-being of the South was based on the slave system. To many Northerners, and every slave, this was an atrocity. For four years, North and South would fight. Over 600,000 soldiers and countless civilians would die. The southern states fought to rule themselves, to defend their way of life. The north fought to save the Union, to put down what it saw as a rebellion. But in the ranks of blue and gray, soldiers on both sides thought they were fighting mainly to preserve their homes and protect their families. For the north, the Civil War began with disaster. Northern generals developed a vast talent for caution, doubt, and delay. A frustrated President Abraham Lincoln remarked that if General McClellan did not propose to use the army, perhaps Lincoln could borrow it for a while. But just then, nearly a year after Fort Sumter, the Civil War would turn. That first great turning point was not one of the bloodiest battles, or the most famous. But the road to Union victory started at Forts Henry and Donelson in Tennessee. For there was one northerner who was entirely willing to fight. He was a quiet fellow, still unknown. Ulysses Grant, who commanded a small force in the west. His orders were to control the Mississippi River Valley. The south had a long line to defend. From the Mississippi Valley all the way to the Appalachians. A line that was stretched way too thin. In western Tennessee, two rivers run north, the Cumberland and the Tennessee. On the Tennessee River, the Confederacy was creating two forts called Henry and Hyman. On the high western bank of the Cumberland, they had Fort Donelson. These forts protected the vital city of Nashville, a network of crucial railroads, communications, and supply for the rebellion. If Grant could take the forts, he could split the Confederate line, and the heartland of the South would be open to Union invasion. At the beginning of February 1862, Ulysses Grant learned that Forts Henry and Hyman were vulnerable. Henry was half underwater and weakly garrisoned. Hyman was still under feverish construction. Rivers were the fast-track highways of the steamboat era. This western half of the Civil War would be a new kind of war, fought along the rivers. For the new war, a brand new but untested weapon, the ironclad gunboat. The Union plan was simple. A flotilla of gunboats would bombard the forts, softening up resistance to Grant's army. The strategy worked better than they dared hope. Confederate generals knew that Henry could not be held. Before the attack, most of the Confederate troops were sent off to Donelson, leaving only a skeleton crew to man the battery at Fort Henry. The Union ironclad steamed in, and the battle began. The ironclad steamed closer and closer, reaching point-blank range to 
save Wing 7 of the Ford's 11 guns. Before Grant's ground forces even arrived, a white flag flew over Fort Henry. The result was one of the Union's easiest victories, yet one of the most significant. The Southern line was split. The Southern High Command had two choices. Neither was good. They could abandon Fort Donaldson, leaving Nashville, the state capital of Tennessee, completely exposed, or they could bring every available man here to Fort Donaldson, a risky move. Instead, they did neither. They issued the order, delay Grant, and leave. Inside of Fort Donaldson, the Southern leaders were General John Floyd, the former U.S. Secretary of War, who had no military training or experience, and General Gideon Pillow, a politically appointed general and veteran of the Mexican War. Third in command was General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Grant's old friend. Weather and poor road conditions slowed the march of Grant's 15,000 Union troops toward Fort Donaldson. By the time Grant arrived, 18,000 Confederate reinforcements had dug in, making a series of outer trenches to defend the fort by land. Grant was reinforced with 12,000 additional troops, but now, on the 13th of February, there was a new presence on the scene. Winter, a blizzard struck. The wind blew so severely that it seemed impossible to walk against it. It seemed certain that we would all freeze. Grant would try to surround the fort and let the armored gunboats shatter its river batteries. The new ironclads would defeat Fort Donaldson as they had Henry. The Federal ships steamed down the Tennessee and up the Cumberland and both sides waited for them to come. In the afternoon, on St. Valentine's Day, Confederates in the batteries at Fort Donaldson saw it coming. Around a bend, smoke loomed high in the sky. Still a mile and a half away, the gunboats opened fire. The Union tried to repeat their Fort Henry victory and moved closer. Pursuit. 
Pill was ordered to return to the fort, stunned his officers. General Buckner noted, I received an order from General Pillow directing me to fall back. It amazed me. The plan of battle seemed to have been changed and the troops were ordered back to the trenches. Just as the Confederate leadership wavered, Grant returned. He saw that the battle was at its crisis, that victory could fall either way. I called out to the men, fill your cartridge boxes quick. The enemy is trying to escape and he must not be permitted to do so. The command came. Union General C.F. Smith would lead his men up the hill on the Union left in the charge that became the classic moment of the battle. What they heard was Smith shouting, Come on, you volunteers! This is your chance! You came to be killed and now you can be! <laughs> Just as we stepped over the breastworks, there was the Yankees. They greeted us with the most galling power. We retreated to the second line of the trench. For the South, all the furious work of the bright morning had been undone, and then stopped. The Confederate generals saw that the way out had again slammed shut. Southern generals convened that evening to discuss their options. Gentlemen, General Floyd told his officers, a capitulation is all that's left to us. The fort would have to surrender. The commander would not stay around for the surrender. A couple of Confederate steamboats were still available at the river, and General Floyd would steam away with his second in command, General Pilk. Third in command, Simon Buckner, had a different sense of honor. For my part, sir, I think it is my duty to remain with my men and share their fate. Nathan Bedford Forrest, a blunt Confederate cavalryman, had no intention of giving in. Forrest took 700 men with him out into the night and made it out unchallenged. In the early hours of the 16th, Buckner dispatched a message to Grant. What terms would Grant give in surrender? No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. That morning, February 16th, 1862, Simon Buckner and U.S. Grant met at the Dover Hotel. The men from Kentucky surrendered the fort with his entire force, at least 13,000 men. But the prisoners were the lucky ones. The Battle of Fort Donelson had claimed the lives of nearly 1,000 Union and Confederate soldiers. recognized a favor that had been done him. He said, Buckner, you are, I know, separated from your people, and perhaps you need some funds. My purse is at your disposal. I thanked him, of course, but did not accept his offer. The Civil War was less than a year old, but it had now changed course. With Donaldson lost, Nashville could not be defended, and the heartland of the Confederacy was open to Union invasion. The South had lost control of vital rivers and railroads, the arteries that linked the Confederate states. The capture of these forts gave the North something else, a general who would eventually lead them to victory. The U.S. in Grant's name, it was said, stood for unconditional surrender. The North needed a hero. Now it had one. Even the Northern purpose for war was beginning to shift from a fight to reunite the nation into a crusade to end slavery. U.S. Grant refused to return slaves to their owners. All three forts, Henry, Hyman, and Donaldson, now became safe havens for freedom seekers. To the north, the unconditional surrender of Fort Donaldson was the first great victory of the war. To the south, the loss of these forts brought something they would never shake off the shadow of defeat. Many years later, a dying Ulysses S. Grant received a visit. It was from an old friend and an old opponent. The facts of my calling upon Grant in 1885 were these. 
I wanted him to know the Confederate soldiers appreciated his conduct at every surrender during the war. My visit was purely personal. Then, I began to see the national significance of it. Twenty years later, Buckner and Grant, like North and South, were slowly coming to terms with the aftermath of the Civil War and the process of healing and reconciliation. Thirteen days after Buckner's visit, Ulysses S. Grant was dead. At his funeral, one of the men who carried Grant's coffin was his friend, Simon Bolivar Buckner.